Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. Jennifer and her sister chose MBK Senior Living for Mom, and as tough as it was, it was the right decision. MBK has a culture of genuine care, one that puts the needs of residents and their families first. They achieve this by building on a solid infrastructure of warm, inviting living spaces and impeccable amenities in attractive, desirable locations. Then their commitment to providing relationship-based care and their attention to each individual sets them apart. MBK gives back to their community, which is especially meaningful to our family. Their commitment every day is to practice compassion and to pay attention to residents' needs so that they can be nimble enough to adjust care accordingly. Their core motivation is, let our family help your family, and I can tell you that for our family that goal is achieved. Mom seems happy, she has friends, and it's certainly a much better situation for her than living with us. At an MBK Senior Living Community, their motto is, we are all family and here is home. For more information, go to their website, mbkseniorliving.com, or give them a call at 949-242-1400. Hi, and welcome back to Fading Memories. Today, I've got two stories for you, two things I think you might want to take advantage of in the coming weeks. The first conversation I have is with the founder of Legacy Fear, and they are a way to record your memories and thoughts to be shared with your loved ones after you've passed away. Now, I know you think, oh, that might sound a little morbid, and that's how I felt when I first was approached by him. But after you hear our conversation, I think you're going to realize that this is actually a really smart idea. You know, my dad passed away almost two years ago, and there are some serious questions I have for him. And had he written these down and used this this website and this company, maybe I would not have all these questions and thoughts that I can't get answered. My second conversation is really quick, but it's with a fantastic young lady named Emma. She is a 14-year-old app creator, and she has created the app Timeless, which is a -a first-of-a-kind, simple-to-use app for Alzheimer's people to remember events, stay connected and engaged with friends and family, and to recognize people throughout through artificial intelligence. That's pretty cool. And with face-based recognition systems. Blah. Easy for me to say. The app comes out hopefully at the beginning of 2019. I have been following her uh, since I learned about her over the summer. And so I'm really excited to get a little update on what's going on. And hopefully she gets it launched when she's planning, which she's managed to hit all her goals. So I'm pretty sure that'll happen. And we can uh, start using that app for our loved ones. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Legacy Fear. Tell me a little bit about you first, and then we'll dive in. Sure. So I'm a registered nurse here in Texas. Um, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. When I tell people that, they're like trying to add it up. And they're like, pretty different items there. How did you do that? uh, It's a long road. Uh, You know, have to cover all that right now. But um, one one statement I would like to say that uh, I just feel it's a it's a very insightful for me uh, having to do specifically with being a Marine and being a registered nurse is that, you know, it's a lot easier to, or it's a lot harder to build, build something up to nurture something uh, healing than it is to destroy something. I believe so, that. My dad was a Marine for four years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying four years here. <laughs> um, but, and I say uh, to everybody, you know what, going through nursing school Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's longer than boot camp. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and it pushed, pushed me to the limits. So, um, but that's really uh, kind of where this idea of the service that I've made kind of come from, um, from nursing. Cool. So why don't you introduce yourself and then maybe we'll jump into how, how you came about legacy legacy fear that's not easy to say it's not it takes a couple times to say it legacy sphere it took practice for me 
but, um, but my name is Aaron Curiali and Jennifer, really thank you for, for meeting with me today and really excited to speak with you. Um, I'm the owner and founder of Legacy Sphere, which the service is LegacySphere.com. And um, this is a service that I've built from really the, something that, that I've observed uh, that comes from something somewhere really special from the heart. Uh, to to help families and I saw a need um, and yeah you know I'm a veteran uh, a lot of a lot of these things that I've done played a very integral part in my life experience and how I got here today and doing what I'm doing to try to hopefully help a lot of people. Can you briefly describe how you got from point A to point B? I know that's a challenge. Sure, definitely. So while in nursing school, uh, no less at the beginning of my nursing career here in school, I was caring for a hospice patient. This particular individual, through their their disease process, they were, you know, obviously they were terminal. Um, they couldn't, they didn't have use of their vocal cords anymore. Mm. So this individual was conscious, um, alert, just the communication was greatly diminished. So that's kind of the, the setup basically here. Um, there was a photo on the wall of this individual and what I probably assumed was his uh, young daughter and taken a long time ago. Uh, he was strong at this point in the photo, really cute photo of his daughter sitting on his lap, which they were both sitting on a big old piece of farm equipment. And it, was just, it was very touching, you know, being in that, in that circumstance of the room, the atmosphere with how things currently were. So um, it just got me thinking, you know, legacy sphere didn't pop into my head right there. Just, you know, it, but it got me thinking about how we communicate with each other here. You know, I started, I think curiosity is a great thing. Everyone should always be curious. That's kind of my motto too. One of my mottos, always be curious. Um, it's good for your brain. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and it helps us learn and grow. I think too, uh, to keep that open mind. Um, but I just wondered how, when was the last time he spoke with, you know, his daughter, like literally was able to speak cause he can't, couldn't any longer. And, you know, later on and over weeks and months, I just thought, you know, he couldn't speak, but even those of us who can, we have the use of our faculties with cognitive and physical. We don't, we're not that great on communicating. Some people are, I think a lot of us aren't though. There are things that we think and feel about like say our loved ones. And we don't communicate those things. We just, we let them go in passing and we never tell our loved ones these things. And when we pass away, they'll never know that we thought those things. Yeah, that's true. So that really got me on the road to, you know what? It doesn't have to be that way. Let me create something that can, if you're not going to share it verbally, you can, you can archive it, record it, and ensure that your loved ones are going to receive that message from you after you pass away. So that's how I got there. So did you have any, have you had any personal experience with family that you've cared for and done this program with them? Um, with the program, no. Unfortunately, I've had a lot of experiences of, you know, losing loved ones, whether it's immediate family or, um, you know, my extended family, my wife's family, um, my wife's close friends. So going to the funeral, funerals, funeral services, that was another thing that really pushed me and motivated me to, to, to do something. You know, when, when we pass away, I almost say um, that's kind of the, the person who passes away. That's the easy part. The, the hard part is the people who we leave behind, especially our loved ones, the survivors. It's like, it's gut wrenching to, to view that and, uh, or to be that person who's, who's hurting. Um, and that just kept motivating me, you know, could the, can we comfort our loved ones? With a, with a little bit of communication from us, ease, ease that grief a little bit. It's not going to wipe it away. We need to grieve. It's, it's, it's natural. But um, could we do something, you know, after we're gone for our loved ones? So, so seeing that, um, yeah, just kept, kept pushing me. And I have um, just a special place in my heart to, to help those who, who are hurting so bad with that. I can, I can relate. Um... My dad was diabetic. He had heart disease and the donated kidney he had was failing and he didn't want to go back on dialysis, which was fine. His heart wasn't strong enough for the dialysis. So hospice was required. 
But unfortunately, he didn't tell us that he needed that. So my husband and my daughter and I show up, and he thought it was 1998. This was a little over, well, it was two years ago this month. And we went from having a good relationship where we had things in common and things we could talk about to him being not that way, in a, in a negative way. And it, there's times, and that really bothers me, because that's what I remember. That's the most recent memories is him being you know, negative and not kind. So it would be a good thing. And then with my mom, she's got advanced Alzheimer's and she thinks I'm her friend. She gets very confused. It's understandable. I do make little recordings. I was visiting with her yesterday. And so I recorded a really short conversation about Thanksgiving. It's something we would have done prior to her memory being completely useless. And I... I'm hoping that hearing those conversations later on will be comforting. So I kind of do the same thing that you do. And so what kind of outcomes are you hoping that users will have as a result of using Legacy Sphere? I said yeah. it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> really a kind of a dual outcome. So on one side, there's the what what we call the subscriber who's using the service to really put down and archive these these intimate messages and the other side is the recipient who's pretty pretty obvious of what that is going to receive those messages i feel and hope that the subscriber is going to gain a peace of mind knowing that for, for me even i can speak it for personal experience so i have a six-year-old son and fleeting times I'll, I'll get a thought of oh my gosh what if well, I, obviously not what if I'm going to pass away one day, obviously just don't know when that's, that's the whole thing. That's key also that we just don't know when that day is going to come. And, um, and I think, you know, a lot of times we take every day for granted and you see the news, unfortunately too many times, uh, hor horrible things. happen. And, uh, well, I'm about 200 miles mm -hmm. South of the cath or campfire. Yes. Our air quality is horrifying because of the fires. And then there's, other fires in Southern California. So I feel like my whole state is on fire right now. I, I watch in the news. I feel, I agree with you. It's terrible. And so, and so who, and who would have thought that, you know, and unfortunately the ones that lost their lives is so sad. Nobody was in that state of mind is um, we leave so much behind. Mm -hmm. And so for me, there's so many things, you know, and, and time ahead of my son, I just don't know. And I, I don't tell him everything. And of course he's what can, there's only so much you can kind of communicate to a six year old. I can't get that deep with him about my feelings and maybe my hopes and dreams and wishes for him and all these great things. So perfect, perfect place for me to jot down these things. So a peace of mind is what it's going to give me. And I hope other subscribers that, okay, I may have not have told them, but I just, I release, I can relax and have some comfort for me ease easing of my mind that they are going to receive those messages and that sentiment and of course for the recipients i hope you know there's so i've talked to people who have lost loved ones and really gut-wrenching stuff of adult mothers who lose their adult children suddenly tragically it's it's horrible it, um mm. horrible and a lot of what i'm hearing is i just wondering how to there's so many unanswered questions. You know, I don't know how they felt about X, Y, or Z. You know, what did they think about, you know, just find family dynamics, really personal things. And because, um, I mean, very, very few of us just know when that day and if it's going to come and plan for it. And we've wrapped up all of our loose ends. <laughs> very, very few, right? Like what less than, less than, less than, less than 1%. So um, I think, and I hope that the recipients are going to get a lot of, whether it's questions answered or a relief, like, oh, they, they did remember this or they, they were proud of me type, you know, kind of general statements uh, or feelings. So uh, affirmations. Uh, but um, my hope is that everybody just gets a positive, you know, effect from that. That would be great. I think with your son, since he's still young, my daughter will be 27 tomorrow. Okay. Um, jotting down like something that, like an everyday thing, you know, I'm assuming he plays baseball or soccer or something. He just finished soccer. Okay. So if you've got something special that happens at a soccer game, I mean, it's kind of an everyday thing and you might not think about it, but like right now you're really proud of him because of X, Y, Z. And 
you know, I can imagine hearing that, you know, let's see, he's six. So if he's 86, that'd be really cool. <laughs> you know, is the, is it recorded or is it written or is it both? Sure. So right. tell me how it works. Yeah. Right now. And you said it perfectly, how it works. That's actually one of the links in the, on the site, how it works. <laughs> um, as of right now, at the inception of the site, as it was developed, I have it only as text basis. So written. There's two reasons for that, though, and purposeful. One is text doesn't, so tech-wise speaking, it doesn't hold a lot of, uh, take up a lot of space, you know, kilobytes and bytes and all that, right? So... Yeah, you don't have to upgrade handwriting. Exactly. Not yet. There's a practical, so there's a practical reason. Takes up very, very little space. No problem with the server where it's being held and all of that. So, um, two is that really kind of a more metaphorical personal opinion here. I feel those thoughts and feelings when they, they exist in our mind and, you know, our little inner voice, once we try to translate them to the out, outer world here in the real world that we really live in, if you turn, as soon as you turn on the camera, like I have done right now and you have done, or as soon as I, you know, I turn on a recording device, audio, I start speaking all kinds of things are happening in the background. We're not mainly aware of it, but I hear my own voice right now when I'm speaking. I have to tell you, I'm not a fan of my own voice. That's my little, one of my, one of my many little quirks. Most people aren't. Yeah. So too, I mean, I can see myself on the camera here too, but I'm wondering, I had to set this up. I was wondering, hey, what background am I going to put behind me? And I, you start thinking all these little things. Did I say that right? Did that come out right of how I was trying to express it? You know, it, did I put the inflection on the right word? Now you're not thinking those things right then and there, but they are affecting subconsciously how you're delivering the message that you had initially in your heart or in your mind. And it gets skewed. But if you just write it down, so much less what I call like static. You're not going to be worried about this or this or that. And you're just going to put down the message and it's going to be very, very true form of what you had in your mind. But so as of right now, just text based in the future, 100 percent, I'll have to have video and audio and that will come. But I get that. That's one of the most common questions I get is what you just asked me there. Well, with, you know, cell phones and all their tools you know i i have a little tiny recording device and i use that but i also use the voice memo on my phone when i deal with my mom because the little tiny recording device hard to tell if it's recording you turn on the little tiny switch and it's it's just, and you just leave it there and it's voice activated it's literally about the size of a piece of gum right and i've had an instance where i thought i was recording and i wasn't and it was frustrating so now i, I use both so if you've got a situation where you're like, I really want to, I want to jot this thought down or preserve this memory. It's easy to do it, you know, with a voice memo or some sort of quick recording. Whereas I don't think a lot of people are good at writing things down. <laughs> some people aren't, some people aren't definitely, uh, they skew towards audio. I, I'm all audio. Some people are pretty decent Pretty decent writing. And then there's a mix of two. Definitely, I see your point with the the ease or convenience, especially if you're maybe, I don't know, you're just not in a spot where you can, okay, I'm going to write this down. I'm sitting, I'm going to write this down. Um, of course, and you can do this all on your phone. You can use this, the service on your phone too. That's what I was just going to say. You can actually sure. dictate it to your phone. You could. You can use in your keyboard. Most of them have that little microphone button and you can speak to text, uh, speech to text there. Um, you got to be careful and proofread, of course, because I know mine. I say, well, so I say, howdy. I'm in Texas. Um, I got some strange translations for that sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, yeah, you got to proof, proofread. <laughs> well, I'm only about 90 minutes from Apple, their headquarters. And my husband actually went to the same high school that Steve Jobs went to. Okay. So we're very close to Apple. I've been an Apple user since 1982. And. I'm always surprised when Siri mispronounces Spanish words. It's like Siri, you're from Cupertino. <clears throat> if that's yep. kind of Spanish or Italian, it's not English. So <laughs> it always cracks me up. But I find because I need to speak slower to my mom and enunciate that I have less trouble talking to Siri. So you have to talk to Siri like she's got a little bit of cognitive de 
deficiency. That is, or you have to speak the Queen's English. I don't know which. You have to, because same that what you're saying, uh, let's say over here, Blanco is a common term all kinds of streets and roads are named blanco um restaurants but uh yeah and it's funny when you like getting gps directions read back or things like that you know blanco like yeah. it, it's so so funny but speech to text that's where it's at for sure well it'll get better over the year i mean i believe siri's gotten better since i don't even remember when they first came out with that but you know there are options so yeah. have you had anybody that's done this that's now gone and their family members are appreciating their I efforts. do so so I, I use the term we a lot I I'm I'm the sole sole person working working this, this business me um, too so the, what is that the royal we or something but um I like to say we because it's it's kind of a community now bringing people in but as far as working now I do have a s- subscriber who has passed away but what I was going to say, we're relatively new. It just launched the service full, full launch uh, late last year. Um, um, of course, I had been juggling my nursing job as well. I'm now full time due to a work nursing injury. Unfortunately, at work, uh, I got injured at work. But um, so full time doing this. So it's a lot of marketing and word of mouth and really speak because it's kind of unique. So speaking with people about what what this is, what it does. So I do have a, a subscriber who has passed away um, there. Part of the how it works, you mentioned earlier. Someone passes away. We don't immediately just start sending out messages. And, and I don't now, And I don't see anybody's messages. So and no future employees will be able to view messages. That's very personal and private. So, um, but we have to verify that the person is indeed passed away. We have to have the due diligence take place. So nothing accidentally gets sent out while that person's still alive, because sometimes there's a reason why some of these messages, these things aren't said verbally Mm -hmm. uh, for all kinds of reasons. So, um, this is a, there is an audit and it's automated. There's an automated verification process to ensure that the person is, is indeed deceased. So this is in a verification process right now. And, and probably in a week though, these messages are going to start being delivered out to that person's recipients. And um, um, yeah, I'll definitely be looking for feedback to, to see, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping it's positive feedback, but uh, yeah. Pretty, and pretty how long has it been since they passed? It's been, where's the it was right at the end of, right at the end of October. So it takes approximately just shy of four weeks to actually complete the verification process. So they, that's, they yeah. That's probably pretty reasonable time. That's the feedback I'm assuming you'd get is the timing of receiving the messages. Was my dad pass away March 2nd, 2017, and we had to, clean out their house. We had to put my mom in a memory community and deal with his funeral. And, and then there was a separate internment at the military uh, cemetery, which isn't super close by. So all of March was just, the best thing about it was I went to my first spring training the very end of March. So it was, you know, Arizona, it's like you guys warm was really warm compared to here. March isn't, it's not, I tell people, I'm from Northern California. Most people would laugh at what I think is cold. You'd probably laugh at what I think is warm. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it was, it was a nice three days, just get away from everything. And, and right after that, I probably could have handled messages. So the four weeks is probably okay. Yeah. To give a little bit of time and people are dealing with a lot of things and emotions and the aftermath immediately following. So, so coming from someone who's lost someone, I was so special fairly recently still do you feel can you imagine even receiving these kinds of messages i mean as best as you can imagine and how do you think it would have been nice because he knew he needed to be on dialysis Mm -hmm. and he didn't tell anybody i mean like i said he he did not have the strength and he didn't want to be was in his advanced directive Mm. but we showed up mark or excuse me november 29th 2016 he thought it was 1998. I had no idea what was going on. So we rushed him to the hospital. If I had known what was going on and if I really understood it, I would have just called hospice. Wouldn't have been easy, but that's what we would have done. So he, 
he went backwards in time to a time where we didn't have the commonality in our relationship. So it wasn't as nice. So it would have been nice if he had planned ahead and, and left messages for, you know, it's my sister and I, we're both married. She's got two kids. I've got a daughter. So if he could have left messages for all of us that basically got lost because he had no idea that his memory would just go out the window. And, you know, it would have been nice because one of my issues with him is hey, my mom's memory is about was two minutes. It's actually decreased since he's passed. But if he had passed away, like he thought he would, which he didn't follow the prescribed general way diabetics pass when they need dialysis. So sure. that's typical of him and my family. But my mom would not have known he was gone. She would have thought he was asleep. So I can only imagine how somebody would have found out he was gone. Wow. So it would have been nice to have some communication before would have been better. But afterwards, maybe just to explain where he was coming from would help because there's a little bit of anger with, you know, I feel towards him. And, and then I feel guilty because it's like, you know, he tried to do, he was very supportive of the whole family. Maybe not in a warm, fuzzy way, but he was very supportive of the whole family. And so it feels bad that I'm angry at him sometimes. Yeah. So a message that anything positive would be nice to have. Definitely. I think, uh, you know, losing a loved one, we just, there's a range, a spectrum of feelings that goes on that we internalize. I mean, from extreme you know, happy memories to like, like what you're just saying, guilt. It's for me, what in just my opinion, guilt is a, that's a tough one for me, in my opinion. Um, so I'm, um, yeah, if some messages can just, just to help people sort through those feelings and put them where they go and just, again, not wonder so much about things. That's the tough part, you know, and yet, again, coming part of it, leading up to why I created this, um, that really hard fact that, you know, once we lose someone, they're just forever gone. There's no rewind. That communication, again, going back to the communication, it's just forever permanently cut off. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's very traumatic. You know, you used to being able to maybe speak to somebody whenever you go either call up the phone or if you happen to see that person often face to face, and then they're just gone and you can't communicate with them if you wanted to. Nothing you can do. And that's it's just something that just pushed and pushed at me um, to do something that, you know what, you can still just almost to ease that transition of, of them being gone, you know, what, just to still get some lines from them. And, um, well, it's yeah, definitely, if it's written down, they can, you can definitely keep it and look at it. Listening to it right at the beginning might be hard, sure. but later on it might be easier. So having both would be nice in the, in the end. I agree. I agree. So you have a lot of ex- experience. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's that's my six-year-old coming in from school. I'll try to have uh, my wife keep him quiet. <laughs> Somewhat. Um, but um, you you have a lot of experience caregiving and, and right in the areas of, again, where in my mind all this was revolving around creating this for people that are going to experience these cognitive problems where even if they can, even if they can communicate physically, it's almost a moot point if they can't go back and, you know, and relate to the person who they have that relationship with. And, and then you, again, you have the flip side, maybe someone who's cognitive, but some kind of physical speech limitations of like ALS, you know, where they lose, they lose their ability to communicate and speak. I mean, um, I just think it's so important, like from me, like in my heart that's gone into this, like while we are alive and able, so cognition and physical, if we're not going to verbally communicate these great little things or insights and stories about ourselves, you know, to pass down that we hope endure our own life, just jot it down, use the service, put it in there so you'll know it's going to carry on. And almost, I always just feel like when I start talking or thinking about it, um, this urgency, like I feel like it, this urgency to, to get the message out and hopefully people will, will take a look at it and maybe use it. But, and you've, 
and you have a lot of experience with the, the caregiver side and that's who I hope to speak to as well. The family members of, you know, if you have somebody that's, you, I mean, you obviously can see, you know, they're, they're trending down as far as their condition and you know what, get, get you, and this service, you can gift the service. You can sign up a family member. It's pretty, it's, it's all really easy to work. Um, and then just get them in front of a, a device or computer to go ahead, just use it, give them some time to use it. And, you know, it's, especially you would think about like grandchildren and, people who you know what i'm like my grandparents i there's so many stories that are gone i'll never know all kinds of insight from them yeah it's just lost and we as like later on i have grandchildren i can make sure those things kind of carry on it's to the future generation i think that's pretty neat yeah i have a grandmother that's a hundred and a half actually yeah. let's see March. so hundred and a half so it's almost eight months it'll be eight months 108 months at the end of this month. Great. And she's great. She's mostly blind from glaucoma, but I should I should look into this because I think that's something that she might actually do. But with people like my mom with, you know, Alzheimer's or dementias, sometimes they start telling you stories and you think, oh, good, this is a, a way back memory coming out. And then all of a sudden you start listening to you, you're like, I have no idea if this is even true. Um, my mom started telling me one day about her grandparents – I guess when her grandfather died, her dad moved everybody to the hometown I'm in now. And she started, and I'm like, oh, that's not a story I've ever heard before. So I, I tried to probe a little bit. And then the story started getting, started getting weird and started falling apart. I'm like, I'm not even sure if this is a real memory or not. <laughs> I had yeah. enough information that I, I asked her some questions. Because I know they lived in um, like a coffee coffee business owner's home here in town. And so I, and I knew some stories about that. So I asked her about it and she had no idea what I was talking about. So I'm like, okay, I have no idea if this memory was true or fall. I mean, I know her grandmother lived next door to them when they were out here. So I had no idea. So I've, I've interviewed way back when I started the podcast, a gal that's living with Alzheimer's and I'm sure she would love to do something like this. If she, I know she journals every day, so she's got that. And you know, it, it'd be nice because then you have some memories other than the same question all the time. My mom's always asking if her husband knows where she's at and it's like, yes, mom, dad knows where you're at. It's right. <laughs> like, you know, and it's hard because it's always my husband and I'm always referring to her to, as mom and, and him as dad. And she still doesn't put the connection together. So it's like, sometimes that's hard because in the 19, 20 months he's been gone, we've reminisced twice about once she made a comment that it was really sad that he passed away and it caught me so off guard that I, th I probably just sat there with my mouth hanging open. And then once we were in the car and we had about a two minute conversation about him and that was really nice because it was genuine. It wasn't, you know, f false memories or memories getting all jumbled up. And then, you know, we go from talking about my dad having passed away to, oh, the sky is very pretty. I'm like, oh, that's over. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be nice if, you know, because well, she denied having it. My, my mom is the third generation on her side of the family with memory loss. Wow. Yeah. So it would have been nice if some of them, one, would not have denied the problem and two, had written down some of these stories because, you know, time goes on. It's like I remember a lot of things about when I was younger with my grandmother you know, but it's like, it, it starts to get fuzzy because there's no way for somebody else to remind me. Right. My sister's four and a half years younger than me. So her recollection of some things is different. And so it's, it's, it's family history that's dying with me. Not that I'm there's going a, anywhere. Any and people have a lot of great stories. I mean, these are like great things within families that make, give families the identity that they have, you know, to, that are being like lost like every day like things are just they just start fading away when when people fade away and uh yep. and that, that's sad but you mentioned like journaling i i convinced one of one of my good friends to use the service he was he's kind of one uh one of those like very few probably but an, very anti-technology type person mm. just by nature in general but i convinced him to use this service which is complete technology web, all web-based you have to have email address everything right because he he said you know what i don't think i need to use the service because i 
I have a, my daughter, I journal. I write down since she's been, since she turned one years old, periodically I go and I write things. And especially on her birthday, I go and write things, just little messages for her to have later. I have them in this little binder. So I'm like, well, that's good. I mean, that is good that one, you're, you're thinking of doing that. You, you, your thought process already led you there. But you're talking about a physical, a physical um, binder, you know, something tangible. What happens if you move? Uh, could it get lost in the shuffle? What happens if, sorry to say this, but if there's a fire? Yeah. Um, got a whole town it, here in California that's gone. Yes. If there's a flood, water damage. I mean, there's so many things. If it's physical in nature and it's paper, I mean, it's so susceptible for loss or damage. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm like, look, this is a, an alternate way to do what you're doing. It's more safe. It's more convenient. It's easier. Um, you can go back and edit or delete messages if you changed your mind, which if you're writing things down, it could get a little, a little convoluted doing all that. But um, yeah, so but being a caregiver, it's like ground zero, <laughs> all the insight, you know, you're, you're struggling with all the, your own feelings and thoughts and you have somebody there that, um, depending on their situation, you know, there's so many things within them. We just don't know. I mean, a lot, we don't verbalize it so much. I mean, that is true. You know, it's, this is a way an, an outlet to to say it without saying it because sometimes it's uncomfortable or, or awkward to say some things you can imagine. I mean, I don't know what kind of man your father was, but there are a lot of men that are on the outside, very tough and, you know, masculine and kind of rough and they're not going around telling their children or, you know, that I love you all the time and I'm so proud of you and this and that and all these mushy feelings, but they doesn't mean they don't feel that way. And, um, could they, you know, put that down in a personal legacy sphere message? Yeah, they could do that. And knowing that, and then they can be received later. And I think that'd do a world of good for people. Oh, I totally agree. And since my daughter's birthday is tomorrow, I'm going to write her a note. There you go. Nice. I haven't had time to go shopping yet. So that might have to be a placeholder, but for sure. I'll, and she's, I've done it in the past and she always loved it. So I'll definitely do that this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Notes are fun to receive too. Yeah. You know, something special on your birthday. I can't believe she's going to be 27. I don't know how that happened. I tell that to my mom and my mom says, well, I always picture her being, and she makes, you know, hand gestures like baby size, which is interesting because they were very close. Um, My niece just turned 13 on Saturday. So there's 14 years between them. So my daughter got grandma for 14 years all to herself. And, you know, at 14, you know, it's, she still wanted to be with grandma, but you know how that is you know, teenager. So it was, it was actually good timing on my sister's part. <laughs> wow. So, oops, get hung up on my cords here. So is there any last little tidbit you should tell people before we sign off and let your son say hello? <laughs> he wanted to. Yeah. He was, he's, he's in his new pajamas. It's uh, what is it now? It's three 30 over here in Texas, but he's in pajamas already. So, um, a lot of a lot of kids wear pajamas to school, so you might be yeah <laughs> might be lucky if that's how just what he changed into. <laughs> right, yeah, he just came home and he's in pajamas. But um, no, really, uh, I just think it's such a vital service. You know, it's so important that all the loved ones we have, we're all gonna we're all gonna pass away one day. I guess, I mean, everyone knows that, but that's my definitely my my parting words is. And this is not to to think about, you know, and dwell on. We don't. We live live in the now. Live live for today. You know, it's not to get anybody down. And but you know what? There's a lot of people out there that get life insurance. There's a reason. Mm-hmm. There's a reason for it. You know, get it. Get the peace of mind. It's done. And okay, you don't think about it every day. And and that's what the service is too. It's not meant for someone to think about all the time. But but you know what? There's some just golden little. You mentioned earlier little you wish you'd hear like every just everyday little things you know maybe type sentiment those are they seem like nothing they're so valuable because if you we don't share little everyday little feelings those are priceless once we're gone for our loved ones for our survivors those little everyday sentiment and feelings are gold for for somebody to receive that from you um 
but yeah, but then thanks, thanks for getting, well, thanks, thanks for reaching out to yeah, me. Thank you, you know, for being a caregiver in general, for hopefully people who are listening, they can relate, you know, caregiving is tough, tough, tough business. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, you take care of yourself. I know you know that I'm sure already you've done yeah. this for so long, but you know, so we're, uh, we're blessed that my mom could move into a memory community because my dad passed away right after my 50th birthday. So my husband and I still work. My sister has school age kids, you know, and perfectly honest. I don't, I don't know about, I can't speak a hundred percent for her, but for myself, there's no way I do not have the mental and physical stamina to deal with somebody that needs 24 hour care and supervision yeah. and where she's at she socializes she helps some of the other residents a little bit because she's still physically fine and I personally think she's happier I know she'd be she's happier there than she'd be here so you know it worked out fine I know a lot of people are not in that situation so I'm I feel very blessed that we're in that situation but you know an hour and a half two hours of visiting on Mondays but all I can take you know and I was never one of those, oh, gosh, I hate Mondays, but I'm uh, kind of not a fan of Mondays anymore. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, but I appreciate it, and I'll definitely make sure your website is linked on the show notes everybody, and on my resources page on the website so everybody Sounds can have good. a great place to find it, and hopefully people will start utilizing it because it's definitely a good idea. Yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, any I don't know if they can be, because it's pretty unique. If there's any questions, I have a lot of uh, stuff in the FAQ section on there as well, which, which you've asked one or two of them, I think, that are listed on there. Um, but I can be reached at an email, easy as an email, LegacySphere at LegacySphere.com is an email. If anyone wants to ask anything or any, any feedback, I always welcome feedback. You know, if you think this is a horrible idea, let, let me know. I love to hear that too. Well, maybe not so much love to hear, but but I definitely am interested in always hearing from somebody about what they think about it. I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out and look, and bring it up with my nana because, like I said, she um, I think she might appreciate something like that. That would be pretty neat. And she's a hundred plus years. I just, there's times like, I can't imagine that. Meant, I mean, I'll be 52 on Saturday, and it's like, first off, that's hard to imagine myself, but. I can't imagine a hundred years. That's yeah. a long time. <laughs> I can't. I always, it's very interesting to me to think about someone who's that age, always just think about their world as it was when they were 15, 16, kind of those monumental years, you know, maybe back then it was a, a 13 or something, but you know, a transition age and what was their world like and, you know, just e everyday things for them. That's, that's always so interesting to me, but because those are stories though that they have, they can tell you about, how was the world when they were at this age or that age? I mean, that's, that gives everybody perspective or allows us to get perspective if we're open to it and think about, you know, how people had it tough. As you go further back, people had it tough, you know, and to give us, you know, wow, I think I have it hard with what they had to deal with or they didn't have Google. Oh my Thanks gosh. For sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, pretty, pretty neat things. Uh, people of your grandmother's age can share with, with all of us for that matter. No. That's true. I might even mention that to her. I'm going to definitely check it out and bring it up with my sister. Cause you know, at a hundred, she doesn't need anything. You know? <laughs> She's got to get rid of stuff. So like, yeah, we spent a lot of time cleaning out my parents' house and I have fears that I'm going to have to help clean out hers. And cause you know, my uncles are older and mm -hmm. obviously my sister and I are local. The um, other kids are not local. So Hmm. gonna be I'm like just start getting rid of stuff just get rid of it <laughs> you don't use it, get rid of it. <laughs> but save the memories because that's yeah. that's cool that's all we basically saved was photographs and you know anything that had meaning and there's the value right how, there right yeah, it's amazing how much stuff is just stuff stuff is just stuff Me memories memories that are tied to maybe an object are, are value so valuable to, to people but yeah, I'd love to, I could see, uh, you know, us being the legacy sphere spotlight kind of be able to, I mean, she would, she would be the oldest subscriber. <laughs> so, um, that would be pretty neat. Okay. Well, I'll do my best to twist her arm a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Reach well, you out have a good me. evening. Yeah. You reach out to me anytime too. I will. Okay. Thanks so much for being on the podcast today.
You got it. Take care now. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. See, I told you the idea sounded a little bit unusual, but I think you'll find Legacy Fears pretty cool, yes? Now, before I start my conversation with Emma from Timeless Care, let me tell you a little bit about her. Her name is Emma Yang, and Emma believes that technology can be used to help solve problems and make the world a better place. She is a strong advocate for STEM and would like to encourage all girls to explore their interest in science and technology. In 2016, Emma was named one of New York's 10 under 20 young innovators to watch and Crane's New York's 20 under 20 2016. Now, here is my conversation with Emma. So joining me today on the podcast is Emma Yang. She is a young lady who has created an app called Timeless for those of, those of our loved ones who are living with Alzheimer's. Welcome, Emma. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining me. So tell me a little bit about yourself and your grandmother who was the inspiration for the app and... Maybe then you could tell me a little bit about how you came up with the idea. Sure. So my name is Emma. I'm 14 years old and I'm a sophomore in high school in New York City. And um, I really grew up with my grandmother when I was living in Hong Kong before I moved about five years ago now. And she really took care of me and raised me when I was younger. And when I was about seven or eight years old, she started kind of forgetting things and getting confused sometimes. And she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so since then, we've been finding ways to cope with that, such as we set up like a whiteboard in our living room to kind of help her remember things. We also um, uh, set up like an iPad for her to look at photos. And so really finding ways to refresh her memory and kind of make sure that she has the information she needs like really accessibly. And so um, the inspiration really came from those kind of uh, things that we set up for her for Timeless, the app that I've developed for Alzheimer's patients and their family and friends. So what Timeless does is it consolidates information like sending photos to family and fr- from family and friends to patients or kind of contacting family and friends um, all into one app that patients can access really easily. And it uses machine learning, um, facial recognition technology to recognize faces and photos so that the patients can kind of see um, which loved ones are sending them photos or in the photos that they're sending. That's awesome. The machine learning was what really fascinated me. Being more of a creative person, I'm, I don't know how you manage to teach a computer how to do those things. Yeah, it's really cool. It's, I'm really excited about it because it's kind of really new technology that's been coming out and it's been, you know, really heated discussion about it. And so I think that it being brought into healthcare is a barrier that we need to break and it could be really helpful in a lot of ways. Well, so tell me about you. How did you, have you always been into computer programming and coding and all that? Is that Um, your passion? Yeah, I'm really interested and passionate about computer science and especially the ways it is applied into real world scenarios. Um, So I started coding when I was six years old and I kind of when I started, I was with, uh, on a tool called Scratch. It's kind of like block-by-block block programming um, tool that you can kind of make animations and games with. And so I kind of started with that, and I got really inspired by that because I realized that, you know, you could create anything you wanted with code. So I kind of worked on, um, you know, worked from there and um, started working on, you know, developing websites, and now I'm developing apps um, and really working in machine learning because I'm really interested about how you can teach a computer how to do really human things that we usually only a person could do, but now we can actually teach a computer how to do it. And when did you start working on this app? Because I know you did a, it was a Kickstarter, yes? Program over the summer? Indiegogo page that Indiegogo. I did around the spring to the summer that I ran to raise money. And I actually raised about $10,000 for that. But, and that was really awesome because you had like over a hundred backers from all around the world. And so I actually started working on this app about a year and a half ago. Um, and I've kind of been working, this was actually the first time I've worked on a full blown app from scratch. And so I've kind of been working from there and really this past, um, year I've been really focusing on, you know, raising money, raising awareness about the app and trying to get this out, out there. 
That's really cool. I actually learned about you through a podcast. Um, Preet Bharara from Stay Tuned uh-huh. mentioned you as like a outstanding person. I don't know if you've ever met him. He's in New York, New Jersey. And that's, I'm like, I heard about it. He, you know, he mentioned you and what you were doing. I looked it up because, you know, of course, I'm listening to his podcast on my phone. So I looked it up right away. And I was like really impressed with how it worked. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. Was, and, like, and then, of course, you know, you started, you said a year and a half ago. So you were 12 and a half when you started this? Yeah. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Making me feel dumb. <laughs> my niece will be 13 on Saturday. So, oh, wow. it, um, so I have somebody to, you know, like a comparative, you know, so I look at her, I mean, she's brilliant too, but it's, I don't know if she's doing coding like you do. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your grandmother, like her life, what, you know, you know, you said she took care of you when you guys were in Hong Kong, but, you know, talk, tell us more about her and her, her life. Uh, yeah. So she is on my dad's side. She's my dad's mom. And, um, my dad also grew up in Hong Kong, as I, I did, and um, she is actually originally from Indonesia. And so uh, she actually is partly the reason why I was kind of raised in a lot of different cultures, not just Chinese, but also kind of Southeast Asian, which I really cherish. And I really kind of like kind of immersing myself in multiple cultures. And so she was taking care of me when my parents were at work when I was younger. So she would read to me and kind of um, watch TV with me and teach me. And so I think she has been really a fundamental part in kind of raising me and as, you know, and with science and cause she was actually a trained mathematician. So, uh, and so, yeah, she's been kind of a really, um, important person in my life. Awesome. So you guys came here when you were how old? I was 10 years old. Oh, okay. So not too long ago. Yeah. And she came with you, obviously. Oh, she's actually still in Hong Kong. Um, oh, is she? Yeah. Oh, okay. We go and visit every uh, about uh, uh, once a year to go visit her. That must be tough because it's more obvious. The decline from year to year must be really obvious. Yeah, um, so that's one of the reasons why you know we really call her really often. And um, that's one of the reasons why we set up the iPad to send her photos because we can just um, kind of text her photos and she can look at them. Her caregiver can show them to her on a daily basis. That's, that's cool. I don't know if you knew, but my mom is um, in advance. She's got advanced Alzheimer's at this point. So uh-huh. I'm learning more about more tools and more cool technology. And it's like, I wish she could have used this five years ago. So yeah. Or let me think, I was just looking at, I was putting a photo on the website of her and my dad. They did pictures every year Uh and I put up a picture from 2011 or 12 and it was like, oh my gosh, just the difference in six years is crazy. Yeah. Um, So tell us a bit about the app and you, you did describe it a little bit, but can you go into more details on how it works? Yeah, so really the app involves three kinds of people. There's the patient, obviously, and then there's also the caregiver, and then there are family and friends, so loved ones. And so the way it works is that uh, caregivers can invite family and friends into the patient's circle, so their group of friends and family and their loved ones, and then they can actually send photos to the patient, as well as the patient can kind of contact them by just pressing a button for call and text so they don't have to remember any phone numbers. (laughs) Um, and they can send, see the photos that patient, uh, that the friends and family send them. The patient can see those photos and they're all labeled and tagged by facial recognition technology so that when they're scrolling through, they'll actually have written there. This is say Emma, your granddaughter. And then there's also, um, a piece of the patient side of the app called identify, which is where you can actually use the camera to identify someone live, um, in front of you. So you can just take a picture and they'll say, uh, this is your daughter. And then um, there's also the events page where you can see, you know, your daily uh, daily upcoming events and the weather information. So really things that um, are really important parts of a patient's daily life that really empowers them to have the information right on them. And it's, um, I was just thinking, it's like some of that I think my mom could still deal with, but she'd, 
she doesn't know how to use a smartphone anymore. So I'll have mm. to show it to her and see what she thinks. That will be an um, interesting update to our discussion. And where are you at in the development of the Timeless app? Yeah, so we're actually nearing the finish and we're planning to release by the end of the year. Um, and so we right now we're just working on, um, you know, finalizing this uh, first version, kind of testing things out. And so I'm hoping to release that soon. That'll be very cool. And I haven't seen it, but I understand you did a TED Talk? Yeah, I did. I did that, um, yeah, about a year and a half ago. Oh, my God. And what was that topic on, on Alzheimer's or on your app? It was kind of about my app and the theme I thought that year was metamorphosis. Uh, for that event. And so talking about, you know, my journey from being like six years old and like kind of playing around with the computer to kind of starting to develop apps like Timeless. And do you have any future app ideas bubbling up in your head now? Um, I mean, right now I'm focusing on Timeless right now, but um, outside of this, I'm also trying to dive into kind of machine, like real machine learning so I've been working on a project that actually uses machine learning to detect lung cancer and CT scans because I really wanted to dive into like the real, you know, artificial intelligence side of things. My goodness. I'm not even sure I can fathom how that would work. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the next step after you release the first version of Timeless? Just test it and get feedback and then work on version two? Yeah, I mean, there are like a couple of things I have in mind for version two that I'm kind of fleshing out right now and then receiving feedback from different kind of people from caregivers and patients at different stages to see how um, they uh, are like kind of using the app and how they want it to be improved and kind of working from there. Can you give us details on what, what they're telling you, the, the people with Alzheimer's, how it's, how it's helping them? Um, it's not out yet, but okay. right now, you know, a lot of the information I've been getting from just like describing the app and then getting feedback on like articles and Facebook is that it could be really helpful, especially with the photos, because a lot of people really relate to, you know, people, their, their loved ones who have Alzheimer's not being able to recognize them. And so, you know, re continually refreshing their memory by looking at photos could really help with that. Yeah. My mom th knows I'm important, but she thinks I'm her friend, even mm -hmm. though I call her mom. She still is confused. I can see how what you're doing would help. My dad used to, you know, with the holidays coming up here, he used to um, order gifts for everybody online, and then he would print out what they ordered, and he, he had them in a spot where she could access it fairly easily because she didn't remember that they ordered gifts, mm -hmm. that he could point to it and say, see here, this is what we got for Jennifer, and this is what we got for her family and this is what we got for our other daughter and her family. So I can see how having that all in an app would have been really cool. Mm. And then, so that was awesome. So do you have any, um, have you learned anything that you can share with caregivers that you want to pass on before we sign off here? Um, really with just kind of making sure they stay connected with friends and family, because I think, um, my grandmother is something that really help, uh, we've been trying to really push for to help her remember is kind of calling her a lot and kind of talking to her and reminding her because like the repetition really helps her to remember. So kind of maintaining those connections with loved ones is really helpful. And when was she diagnosed? How long ago again? About when I was um, seven or eight years old. It's about six years ago now. Okay. And so is she still kind of in the earlier stages or is she kind of moving on more to the middle stages of the disease? She's kind of in the middle stages. Like she can still recognize me and my dad and my mom when, she, when they visit, but like some of her more distant friends, she kind of doesn't remember. And sometimes she like, she doesn't know how to use the TV. Like she'll think it's a phone sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah. She'll try to pick it up and try to call people, but yeah, we've, she's been okay so far. It's sometimes a very long journey. I knew my mom had, we thought it was dementia at the time. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother and my maternal great grandmother all had memory loss at the end of their life. So mm -hmm. this is not good genetics for me, unfortunately. Yeah. And I knew that she had dementia or memory loss or something was definitely going on in the early 2000s. So we're here at the end of 2018 
and she's still with us. Not mm. phys- physically, mo- it, she is. Mentally, it's getting worse. Mm. Um, so she has a neuro- neurologist appointment December 3rd. So that will hopefully give us some information because when I looked back at pictures from just, you know, several years ago, it's amazing how much she's digre- you know, digressed and that's not quite the right word, but she's degenerated into, you know, she doesn't take care of her appearance like she used to. And that's, that's hard. It's hard mm-hmm. to, you know, cause there's, it's my mom. And at times I think, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's, um, you know, she doesn't, I knew she didn't want to end up like this. She didn't want to end up like her mom. Mm-hmm. And it's frustrating to see that, you know, that's exactly what happened. So like I said, when I found out about your app, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I wish, you know, I wish my mom was either at a stage where she could use it or you'd come out with it five years ago, which would have made you really, really, really young. So (laughs) neither one of those two things was going to happen. So I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah. Thank you so much. I look forward to the launch of the app. I'm a, you know, I'm on the website, so I'll, I'll know when that happens, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, have a terrific evening. Yep. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Yep. Bye. Bye. -bye. Now, after recording this conversation, I got an email update from Emma just about Thanksgiving, and I wanted to read it to you because it's pretty interesting and obviously it's pretty relevant. She says, first of all, I would like to let everyone know that Timeless has won the Bayer Foundation's Aspirin Social Innovation Award. I couldn't make it to Berlin for the final pitch, so I pitched in my living room via Skype. The win was definitely a surprise. There were so many amazing startups who were equally worthy of the award. I am grateful for the opportunity and will do my very best to maximize the impact of this award. Thanksgiving is always a time to reflect on the progress of the previous year and a time to start planning for the upcoming holidays. For Timeless, 2018 has been a phenomenal year. Indiegogo campaign, Women Who Tech Startup Challenge, Fast Company Coverage, CBS Evening News, Bill Gates tweets are among the many wonderful experiences I've had this year. We are now at the final stage of development and have started testing the app. I can't wait to finally launch the product and get it in the hands of those in need. Would any of these things have happened without your support? Absolutely not. Thank you for your support and for believing me in me. My age has worked against me, and it's not unreasonable to doubt whether a 14-year-old could deliver. But you're the visionary and pioneer who shed light on my way. I am forever grateful for your support. On this special day of the year, I wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving, Emma. So I hope this episode gives you some really great ideas on ways to help our loved ones living with Alzheimer's or dementia and a way to preserve our thoughts and memories for future generations in a simple and easy and private way. I appreciate your listening. Thanks again, and I'll be in your ears again next week. Are you looking for a way to connect with your loved one? Maybe an activity you can do together instead of sitting around answering the same questions over and over again? Have you checked out two lap books yet? If you haven't, you're missing out on something that I am certain you and your loved ones will thoroughly enjoy. Two lap books have changed many of the visits I've had with mom tremendously. These simple read aloud books were created specifically for memory challenged adults. You see, people living with Alzheimer's eventually lose their ability to initiate conversation with others. Because of this, these uniquely adapted books, quote, give voice to these loved ones. By using the book's large, simple text and beautiful, colorful illustrations, we can initiate conversations. Most noteworthy, we can make meaningful connections with our loved ones and help stimulate their mind. Caregivers will enjoy sharing these books and creating purposeful, interactive activities for engaging people with memory deficits. Reading these books together could very likely bring out memories you can cherish together. There's a link in the show notes to the My Favorite Things page on my website. The page is linked to the Amazon pages of all my favorite books and products that have helped me with my mom over the years. Definitely check it out. 
I'm certain you'll find something that will help you like they helped me. That's why I created this page for you. Hey listeners, can you do me a big favor? Can you click on the five star button right there on your phone? Or head over to Apple iTunes and leave a rating or review? This is how new people find my podcast, and I can't be a supportive podcast if people don't know I exist. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.